Hi everybody. So we're gonna take a quick break from looking at React and start looking at something that is actually often used with React to make building our applications just that much better. And that is the Redux library. And here's the thing. When we're building apps, there are a lot of challenges we run into, but one of the biggest challenges is keeping our application state, the data our app relies on, in sync. Not just in sync with internally whatever is going on, but also with any UI that is being displayed as well. And here's the reason why that is a challenge. When we have app, when you have UI, your app has a lot of logic in place for being able to display it in the most simple of cases. But when you have data that's being updated from various other parts of your UI, you start creating these various dependencies that become very difficult to manage. What ends up happening is what happened to be a very simple situation now ends up looking a little bit like this little maze of lines and nodes you see right here, where every single component in our app is somehow interdependent on other parts of our app for its functioning. And as your app gets more complex, being able to make sense of what's going on becomes very difficult. And that's really where the source of many of our problems end up coming into where diagnosing race conditions and just state being out of sync ends up being a very, very costly part of building some of the applications that we build. And so that's where Redux comes in. Redux is all about simplifying how we store and update our application state. And that's all that Redux does as well. It is not a library of its own that tends to step on so much of React's toes in how everything happens. It's really all about this very specific, very complex problem of just making state management more sane. So here's the way React Redux works. Let's say we have an app. And for the purpose of this app, it's, it could be any app that we want. It just has some state that it has to maintain. And that state is somehow visualized on our screen. What Redux does is it first does away with all the various data stores that your app might have. Could be an individual component, could be some other mechanism. It simplifies it all down to one location. All of our application state is now centralized in one location, which in the Redux world is called the store. So we no longer have multiple places our app needs to rely on for getting the data that it needs to operate. That's the first thing. Now, there are a few more pieces in play, and instead of describing each one individually, I'll just show the full workflow end to end. What Redux really does is enforce a chain of command that you must follow in order for any state in your application to get updated. You have your app, you fire what's known as an action, which tells you what to do. The action then relies on a reducer, which in turn updates our application state, which is stored in our store, and that tends to fire back to our application, which then updates what you see in our screen. Now, we'll look at all three of these components in much greater detail when we look at the code, because right now, they're just random keywords that I'm using to describe what's happening. Just know that in order for any data in our application to be modified, you must follow the action reducer store path, and you can't take any shortcuts, you can't bypass any of them, you have to follow this particular arrangement. So the store is where all of our application state lives. The action describes what to change in our store, and the reducer is kind of the intermediary. It determines what the final state will be for whatever action was passed into it. And we'll see more of that in the code in a few moments. Now, you're probably wondering, the idea of a centralized location where application state is stored sounds brilliant. In fact, why can't we just use that approach for not just reading data, but sending data as well? It seems like just relying on that one approach will solve a lot of our problems. Why can't we just have an arrangement that looks a little bit like this? Let's avoid this whole thing about actions and reducers and that whole complex path that we looked at earlier. The challenge with this, challenge with this approach is this. As our apps get more complex, you, the, one of the bigger problems is not just having a centralized location for where our data gets updated, it's also having some predictability, being able to make sure that our data is being updated and what is being updated is in sync with what's going on in the rest of our application. And so this model, while it works, it happens to very quickly take you down a path where you're back in that spaghetti-like maze of code where you're trying to maintain application state, make sure it's in sync, and make sure it is also accurate for what we're trying to do. And so what Redux does is it brings predictability to state management. And there are three principles the creators of Redux have outlined as things that, that motivated them for, being, for creating Redux, and some of them are this. The first thing which we talked about is your entire application state is stored in a single location. And the benefit of this is that you don't have to search across a variety of data stores to find a part of your state you want to update. Keeping everything stored in a single location ensures you don't have to worry about keeping all this data in sync. That's one of them. The second one is that your state should be read only 
and can only be modified through actions. This is the chain of command that we saw enforced in the diagram. So in the Redux world, random parts of your app, even if they want to, can't access the store and modify the state stored inside it. The only way our app can modify what's in the store is by relying on actions. And the last thing is this. And this is actually a very complex thing to fully explain, but when you look at the code, it'll start to make a little bit more sense. What we do is that we never modify the data in our store. You, we just specify what the final state should be. And that's where the reducer comes in. And the reducer's responsibility is, making, is trying to essentially maintain the integrity of the data so that we can go forward or backward if we need to undo an action, for example. So the way, best way to make sense of this is to just look at some code and try to cement some of the diagrams and text that we've been looking at in the past few moments. So I'm not going to show a code pen for this because it's a very simple example. And it's also going to be command line driven. What we're looking at is just how Redux works. We'll talk about how to integrate Redux as part of a React application later. But for now, I feel it's just write some code to really nail the basics of how Redux works and put some of those concepts we just saw you know, into more, into more like something that's more tangible, the like actual code that runs and does things. So go ahead and create an HTML page and just add the following into it. As you can see, this page is mostly empty, except for the script tag where we're bringing in the Redux library. Now, just like we, saw, we did with React earlier, we, there is a more modern way of being able to incorporate Redux as part of your development workflow. But for the purposes of what we're doing right now, which is just learning how to use Redux, it makes sense to just import the library and just have everything run in the browser. You wouldn't do that in real life, but for learning things, it is completely fine. So make sure to copy these contents into a new HTML page. And once you've done that, let's first look at what an action does. So the first thing to keep in mind is the action is the only mechanism our app has to communicate with our store. So the action really is the gateway to anything we want to do that will end up affecting our application state. So into the script tag in our document, go and add the following two things, the following two functions. What we have here are two functions, add color and remove color. Oh, let me take a step back. The example we're going to create is a very simple case of we're going to have some colors that we're going to add and remove just to maintain a list of our favorite colors. Nothing, nothing too crazy going on there. And so because we want to maintain a list of our favorite colors, the two functions we'll have are add color to add a color to our list, and then remove color to remove it. So here we have two functions, add color, remove color. They take one argument called value, and inside them, they return an object. And this object that they're returning, that is actually the action that we're talking about. And so an action can have you know, a variety of shapes and forms, but there is one thing it needs to have. One is the type property. This type property is a signal. It tells our app what you intend to do. In this case, for the add color function, we have a type property called add. And then we have a property called color, which is the value of the color we want to add. So the properties, you can have as many properties as you want. You can name them whatever you want. In this case, we have color. And likewise, we have another action for removing a color. So in the remove color function, we're turning an action object whose type value is remove, and then its color property is value. Now, there's a more formal name for these two functions. They're known as action creators. So add color, remove color. They're action creators because what they're doing is they're creating actions. And you have type add and type remove for the two actions we'll be dealing with in this particular example. So the actions is the first part of what we need to find as part of using Redux. You know, our actions define what we like to do, but the exact specifics of what exactly happens and how our new state is defined is handled by a reducer. And the reducer is really where the most exciting things happen. It's also the most complex piece of code you'll often end up writing as part of working with Redux. So let's just take a look at what a reducer does. A reducer, very simply, does three things. It provides access to our store's original state. It allows you to inspect the action that was currently fired. That's important to kind of determine how you want to modify the data in our store. And it also allows you to set our store's new state. So let's take a look at what a reducer for this example would look like. So here I have a reducer called favorite colors. Notice this is a function, and it takes two arguments. One is the current state, and the second is the action that was used as part of invoking it. So the first thing we do is, let's go through the code line by line. The first thing we do is this. If this is the first time your application is running, there will be no state. So your state will be undefined. And if that's the case, I'm essentially saying state will be an empty object. Nothing is going to happen. Nothing's going on there. 
or in this case it's an array object. And then what we do is check what we're depending on the kind of action we have to modify what a reducer behaves. So if the action type equals add, we're going to do state that concat action dot color. And we saw color was one of the properties that our action has. So we'll be adding a color value to our state if the action's type was determined to be add. And also if our action type was remove, we use the filter method to return a value and remove the state, the color from our current state. And if you pass in a type that is neither add nor remove, which is an un, you know, indeterminate state, we don't make any modifications to our state. We just return it as is. And the important part is this. There are three things you cannot do with a reducer. And this is kind of extending upon what we talked about, one of the principles earlier, where in Redux, your application state is never modified. It is just replaced with the, a new version of the state. So inside a reducer, you can never, you should never mutate its arguments. What we saw earlier for state and action, you shouldn't modify it. You leave it as is. You cannot perform side effects like API calls and routing transitions. You can't rely on any external code whose predictability is kind of up in the air. You don't know what the API call is always going to re return, and you don't want to m change the current context of your overall application by routing somewhere else. And the last one is you cannot call what's known as non-pure functions. And these are functions that, for a given argument, might return a different value every single time. One of them is date.now. The other one is math.random. It's hard to predict with any kind of certainty what the value will be for these at any given moment. So you, shouldn't, you should avoid them and all these things. And the other thing I have to mention is that all these guidelines are not enforced by the Redux library or anything that we're talking about. It's just things that you need to be very conscious of as a, as a design principle as part of building your application. You can all, you, if you want to, you can mutate the arguments, you can perform side effects, and you can even call non-pure functions. But by doing so, you kind of move away from the problems Redux is trying to solve and start walking more towards the original situation where the code for maintaining your application state becomes really confusing and clunky and messy and all of that. And so right now, we have our action figured out, we have a reducer figured out. All that really remains is the store piece. And fortunately, this is the easiest part of them all. To create a store, all you have to do is call redux.createStore and then pass in the argument, which is the reducer that we want to use. So here we have a store object and we're creating a store with the favorite colors being the reducer that is going to be associated with it. Now. This is all good, right? Let's take a quick look at the code and see how it works. But before that, the way we want to see everything working is we call the dispatch method on our store object and we specify the action that we want to go through. And this is very specific to what we're doing right now because we're using Redux in a very raw form without any UI library, without any kind of visual updates going on. So we're kind of kind of like going very deep in the woods here and dealing with the Redux store object directly. But as we'll see later, you may not often call the dispatch object directly, but rely on whatever library or framework you're using for maintaining your application's visuals to do that automatically for you. But first, let's go and look at the code. So here I have an example that we just saw earlier in, in PowerPoint. I have it currently in Visual Studio Code right here, exact same code. And because our app has no real UI, I just have it set to display in the console. And let me just refresh the page to make sure any changes that were there are automatically represented. All right, so in the console, we know we have store equals redux.createStore. Our store object is right here, and it's called store. Let me type in store to make sure that everything looks fine. And it does. Store looks just great. So what I'm going to do is call a dispatch method on it. So I'm going to do store.dispatch. Oh, I actually already have some things previously you know, included from what I did earlier. So let's do dispatch add color blue. And the way you do that is by calling the dispatch method and passing in an argument, which is really our action creator with the, whose argument is going to be the color we want to add. So store that dispatch, dispatch, and then add color value blue. I'm going to hit enter. Let's add a few more colors as well. Store that dispatch, add color, and let's add green. Why not? Seems like a good color to add. And let's add one more as well. Store that dispatch, add color, and yellow. Make it lowercase just because I want to be consistent. All right. So what we've done now is in our store, in our application, we've added three colors, blue, green, and yellow. To see what this looks like, I just have to do store.getState, which gives me the current values that are currently in my store object. 
So you can now see store.getState has blue, green, and yellow. Nothing, nothing too complex. And likewise, if I want to remove a color, why do I do is the same thing. I still call the dispatch method. And in this case, instead of using the add color action creator, I'll use the remove color one instead. So I'm going to dispatch remove color. And let's just take, let's take blue. Let's remove the blue color. Hit enter. So now we can see that at least according to what our code should be doing, we are going to remove the blue color from our store. And we can double check that by just looking at get state and inspecting the values that are currently inside of it. And you can see now that green and yellow are the only values that are stored and blue is no longer available. And all this was the important part to focus on is that we're using a dispatch method and what we're passing to dispatch every time is an action creator. We're not in any way specifying something that would modify the state directly, nor are we kind of influencing a reducer's behavior outside of whatever our action is currently defining, which is type add and type remove. That is an important part of just maintaining the integrity of our data by following the chain of command Redux enforces. So that's a very quick overview of Redux and why it is why it exists and how you can use it to solve problems. Now, if you take a step back and just look at what we just did, we create an example, we have a state object, and we just added and removed colors. That's really all we did. If the scope of our problem was just that, you can imagine that Redux would be a pretty complex solution for what would simply be some very primitive array operations that we've pretty much had for decades at this point. But Imagine the problem gets more complex. Imagine you have more parts of your application, more parts of your UI that are relying on this data to be in the current state that they're in. Then you kind of have a more complex problem. It becomes more tricky to maintain state, kind of like what we talked about at the very beginning of the video. But the part that makes it very interesting is that no matter how complex your app gets, no matter how many components you end up having, no matter how many data sources that end up feeding data to our data store, the approach for populating the values in our, in our store will never change. You'll always have to rely on actions, which in turn are called on by reducers that then inter inter interface with the store and make the changes that it needs to be done to update our application state. And that kind of a the tunneling of all this data into one, one narrow pathway ensures that you don't have the problem of random parts of your app modifying state without other parts of the app notifying, knowing, knowing about it or being notified and updating as a result. So that solves the biggest problem. And we'll see some of that as, look, as we look at how React and Redux work together to solve some of the more complicated state problems that we had, especially when we're talking about transferring props from one lower level component all the way to some parent or child component somewhere in other parts of our app. So with that, if you have any questions, feel free to post on fortnetgroup.com where others, I and others would be happy to help you out. If you like this, tell your friends and enemies. Tell your friends, enemies especially, because Redux is a very common topic that people have questions about. And so your enemies today might become your friends tomorrow, all thanks to you sharing this video on Redux. So you can thank me later. Hit subscribe to be notified of other videos in the series about React and other web development topics. Follow me at Krupa on Twitter for various sized updates on web technologies, funny cat videos, just things that might be interesting to you that, uh, that I definitely find interesting. And also, if you like to learn from not videos or from online modern technologies, you can buy a book. They're still printed using paper and other old world technologies. So definitely give that a shot if that is your inclination. And with that, I will see you guys next time.